We come now to God's Word, found in Luke chapter 4. We'll be reading Luke chapter 4 this morning, verses 14 through 30. You can find that on page 1021 in your pew Bible. Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 30. Let's give our attention to the reading of God's Word. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And a report about him went out throughout all the surrounding country. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, No prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the cliff on which their town was built so that they could throw him down off the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Father, may these words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer, in Jesus' name, amen. I want you to imagine something ridiculous with me for a moment. Imagine that the Chicago Bears actually win the Super Bowl next year. I know you all laugh. But imagine just by some miracle it actually happens. They win, and they return from Glendale, Arizona as champions. There's a massive celebration downtown, a victory parade, culminating with a victory press conference in front of Soldier Field. Everyone's excited and shocked and thrilled. But imagine something further with me for a moment. Imagine somebody were to stand up at that press conference and say, hey, wait a minute, aren't you the Chicago Bears? Aren't you the team that hasn't won a championship since 1985? Aren't you the team that hasn't even won a playoff game in 12 years? Aren't you the team that is now on their fifth head coach in 10 years? There is no way you won the Super Bowl. I wasn't there. I didn't see it. You are making this up. And now imagine even something further. This person is able to convince all the rest of the crowd of their position. And so we reject our hometown championship team and drive them out of town. Sounds like a ridiculous scenario. And it is. But it's not too far off 
from what we find in Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 30. It's not that far from this reality. As we saw last week, Jesus just won a great victory, a magnificent victory in the wilderness, a victory against sin and temptation and Satan. And then he goes in the power of the Spirit to Capernaum and the surrounding regions, just demonstrating his victory through signs and wonders. And then he comes home to Nazareth to his hometown, declaring his victory. And they don't accept him. They don't accept him in praise. They actually reject him. And not only do they reject him, we find when we get to the end of this passage, these people actually want to have him killed. What changed? That's the question. What makes Jesus so controversial? What do we find in this passage that makes Jesus so controversial? Why is the news of his victory so divisive? Why does Christ stir up in the people of Nazareth such anger and wrath that they're ready to execute him on the spot? Why is Jesus so controversial? That's the question that our passage answers. It answers that question within the context of the people of Nazareth, certainly. But it also answers the question for us today. Perhaps you've always wondered, why do people react so strongly to the message of the gospel? What is so aversive about Jesus? Why do people so often respond to the news of Christ's victory with rejection? Our passage gives us Two answers. Why is Jesus so controversial? First, because he preaches a subversive message. And second, because he exposes our hearts. So first, because he preaches a subversive message. After the temptation, we find Jesus returning in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And word quickly spread about him. From what we read later on in the passage, it's clear that he began performing miracles and signs in that region, at least in Capernaum. Most likely, this is also the time when Jesus performed his first miracle, the miracle of turning water into wine in Cana of Galilee. The ministry of Christ was beginning in force. In the power of the Spirit, he was displaying the reality of his victory. And people were beginning to take notice. It says in verse 15 that in this region, in the region of Galilee, he was being glorified by all. And then he came to Nazareth, where he was brought up, his hometown. You might expect that based on how things were going so far, that coming to Nazareth would just be a victory lap for Jesus. These were his People, this was his home. As the saying goes, there's no place like home. During a traditional Sabbath service where we find Jesus in this passage, there were a series of prayers followed by an invitation from any man in the congregation to stand up to preach, to read a text and to teach from it. The equivalent would be for us here at First Church to finish our pastoral prayer And then to look out at the audience and say, now who would like to preach? It's kind of terrifying, isn't it? But that was the custom. A man from the people would come forward, read a passage of Scripture, and then teach. And so as Christ comes to do this, as he gathers with his people on the Sabbath, as was his custom, you might expect that this is the very moment that he would be accepted by his hometown. But Jesus stood up to read, and these are the words that he read from Isaiah the prophet, verses 18 and 19. Look back there with me. He read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. These words are a quote 
of Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 2. A prophecy to the people of Israel that one day a prophet was going to come to declare good news to God's people. Good news of salvation. A prophet was going to come. And this prophet was here. As Christ will go on to say in verse 21, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus was the prophet who would preach a message of salvation to God's people. He would preach. Christ performed many miracles during his earthly ministry. He performed many signs that validated his authority. But the primary ministry of Christ was preaching. That's what he says at the beginning of verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. Proclaim here means the same thing as to preach. Last week we saw Christ use the word of God to defeat Satan in the wilderness. This week we see Christ preach the word of God to his people so that they might repent and believe. And as he says, he preaches in the spirit of the Lord and under his anointing. Meaning he preaches in the power of God's spirit and under his anointing authority. And in this we see a picture of how God intends to accomplish his purposes in this world. Jesus demonstrates to us as a church what ministry primarily consists of. Not in signs of power, not in human wisdom, but in the preaching of the word of God, in, under the authority of God, in the power of the spirit of God. As John Calvin commenting on this passage states, these words here inform us that both in his own person and in his ministers, Christ does not act by human authority or in a private capacity, but has sent, been sent by God to restore salvation to his church. He does nothing by the suggestion or advice of men, but everything by the guidance of the Spirit of God. And this he declares, in order that the faith of godly men may be founded on the authority and power of God. Put it more simply, if the preaching of the Word of God in the power of the Spirit of God was enough for Christ, it should be enough for us. We dare not stray from the path that he has set for us. And what is the substance of what Christ preaches here? He says first that he has begun, he has been anointed to preach good news to the poor. In this we begin to see the subversive nature of Christ's message. The way that his message subverts, it upends our worldly categories. The good news of the gospel is for the poor. Now Jesus isn't just speaking here of the materially poor, but of course he has those in mind. Christ is speaking of those who are poor in spirit. The spiritually humble. As Christ will go on to say in Matthew 5.3, Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see, Jesus doesn't go after the influencers in society. He doesn't go after and target politicians or the academic and religious elite. He preaches good news to those who are ready to receive it. As one commentator explains, it is the poor in general who sense their need in the greatest way and as a result, respond most directly and most honestly to Jesus. Jesus comes to the poor in spirit because it is the poor in spirit who are the most ready to receive his word. And what is the good news that Jesus preaches to the poor? Look back at the second half of verse 18 with me. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. 
Jesus here describes our sorry estate outside of his saving work. We are captives, trapped by our sinful flesh. We are spiritually blinded, fumbling around in the dark, unable to save ourselves. And we are oppressed, oppressed by our own sin, sitting underneath the weight of the wrath of Almighty God. This is a subversive message that Christ preaches to this crowd. It is not a message that you would preach if you wanted to win friends and influence people. Jesus Christ here does not tell these people what they want to hear. He does not tell them something inspirational. He does not come to them with a message that is positive and encouraging and inspirational. Christ didn't come to inspire. He came to save. And so the message that he gives to these people may not be necessarily what they want to hear, but it's what they need to hear. They may think that they want to hear, here's how to fix this yourselves. Here's how to clean yourself up. You're doing just fine. Here's a little help. You can do it. But that's not what he tells them, is it? He says, no, you are not fine. You cannot do this yourselves. (laughs) You are enslaved. You are lost and blind. Left to yourselves, your sin will crush you and it will destroy you. Praise God that Christ does not just offer us a message of inspiration. Praise God that he gives us a message of salvation to the enslaved. Come and find freedom to the spiritually blind. Come and receive true sight to those oppressed. Come and receive true freedom. And then the last phrase here that sums all of these together. Christ proclaims the year of the Lord's favor. This is a reference to the Old Testament ceremony of the Jubilee. When every 50 years, the debts of all the people in the land were forgiven. They were released and there was a massive celebration. That is what Christ invites us into. That's what Christ invites those who are poor in spirit into. Come and celebrate the freedom of the forgiveness of your sins. Come and celebrate and find true liberty. Come and receive true sight. Come and marvel at the grace of God. As we just sung a moment ago, amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. This was Christ's message to these people. And after he finished speaking, he rolled up the scroll, handed it to the attendant, and sat down. And everyone just sat there in stunned silence. What would he say next? Verse 21. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. It's hard to overstate the significance of these words. You see, there have been many prophets in the history of God's people who had come to God's people and preached good news. There had even been many prophets who had come before God's people and told them difficult things that they did not want to hear. There had even been many prophets who came before God's people and pointed them to salvation that was coming. But there had never been, nor will there ever be again, a prophet who could stand before God's people and say, this is fulfilled today in me. The salvation that you are looking for, it's here now today and it's fulfilled in me. This is a subversive message. 
Because we live in a culture that likes options. We don't like one opinion. What do we do? You go get a second opinion, or a third opinion, or a fourth opinion. If we don't like one piece of advice, we go ask someone else. If we don't like one spin on the news, we go find a spin that fits us nicely. Everything is tailor-made for us. So we appreciate different experts giving us their opinion, but we react so strongly to someone who says they have an exclusive claim on truth. You can give me an option, you can give me an opinion, but don't be so exclusive. But friends, notice that Jesus doesn't sheepishly give these people in front of him multiple different avenues for salvation. He doesn't say, well, you could try this way, or perhaps you could try this way, or maybe you could try this way. What does he say? This is the plan of salvation for the enslaved, for the blind, for the oppressed. I am the only way. This prophecy is fulfilled today, and and it is fulfilled in me. I am your exclusive Savior. There is no other way. And it is this exclusive Savior, with his subversive message, that begins to expose all the thoughts and the intentions of our hearts. That's what we see as we move on in this passage. At least initially it seems that maybe the people of the synagogue are going to respond positively to Jesus. It says in verse 22, all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. But it's clear from their response later on in this passage that that this marveling was nothing more than a momentary amazement. They were impressed by Christ's rhetorical prowess. His message had tickled their ears, but it never reached their hearts. And as a brief aside, this is a serious danger both for preachers and for those receiving preaching. Preaching. It's even a danger in congregations like ours that value good preaching. The temptation is on the one hand to preach sermons that are shallow and easy to receive because you want to be popular. Or the temptation is on the other hand to receive preaching at only the head level. To enjoy preaching because it is nice to listen to and intellectually stimulating without ever submitting our hearts to the authority of God's word. To have God's word tickle our ears, but never reach our hearts. To say amen with our mouths, but never say thy will be done in our hearts. Receiving God's word in this manner leads to a shallow faith that quite often reveals itself to be no faith at all. That's what we see in the people of Nazareth, don't we? They so quickly go from, what a nice young man. How eloquent. He's an effective speaker. To saying, hey, wait a minute. Isn't this Joseph's son? You know, this is the third time in this chapter that someone has questioned the sonship of Christ. Twice, Satan tempted Christ with, if you are the son of God. And now here, in his own hometown, he is met with skepticism and doubt and ultimately rejection. Is this not Joseph's son? In other words, they're saying, who does this guy think he is? We saw him grow up right here in Nazareth. He's a nobody just like us. And Christ here reads their minds. 
he hears and understands the thoughts of their hearts. Just like Satan, they're questioning his sonship. And just like Satan, they want him to perform signs to impress them. And this is what he exposes in verse 23. He says to them, Doubtless you will quote to me the proverb, Physician, heal yourself. Well, we have heard you did a Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. The people of Nazareth had seen Jesus grow up. Can you imagine that? Watching the incarnate Son of God grow from a boy into a man. They'd never seen him sin. They'd never seen him disobey his parents. They'd never seen him lie. And yet that witness wasn't enough for them. Then they'd heard of the wonders that he performed in other towns, the wonders, the signs that he performed in Capernaum, the miracles that had happened. And yet that witness wasn't enough. And then they heard his preaching. The spirit-empowered word of God that had proceeded from his mouth, the beautiful news of the gospel, And yet that witness wasn't enough. The word of God wasn't enough for them. They wanted something else. They wanted signs. They wanted to see what everyone else was seeing. They wanted this self-professed doctor to heal. This physician to prove his worth by healing in front of them for their own benefit. And to them, Jesus replies, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. Meaning, essentially, people of Nazareth, I've judged your hearts already. And I know that no matter what you see, you won't believe because you will not receive my word. Because you will not submit yourselves to my word, you will never receive me. I will never be acceptable among you. You see, the signs of Christ, the miracles, were never meant to create faith in the audience. They were meant to confirm the faith who came to Christ, the faith of those who came to Christ in dependence on his word. Those who came to Christ undependent on the word of his power. So that the faith of the people of God would be dependent on the word of God. Essentially, these people were coming to Jesus and saying in their hearts, let us see and then we'll believe your word. And Jesus' response is, it is only when you believe my word that you will truly see. You were unworthy of my works because you have not faith. Jesus here exposes in the people of Nazareth an unbelief in his word. If they will not receive his word, they will never receive him. You know, this really is a question for all of us here today. Is the word of God enough for us? Or do we want something more? You know, the first and primary sin is unbelief. Unbelief in the word of God. Did God really say? When we hear the news of Christ's victory, That in him, sin-bound captives receive freedom. That in him, the spiritually blind receive sight. That in him, the sin-oppressed receive liberty. Is that word enough for us? Do we receive that word with faith and joy and trust? Or do we begin to think in our hearts? You know, talk is cheap. I want to see Friends, it is so easy 
for the Word of God to tickle our ears and never descend to our hearts where it becomes our rock-solid assurance. And when that happens, our hearts will always functionally find their assurances in the things of this world. When we cease to be dependent on the Word of God, we become enslaved to the tyranny of what we can see with our own two eyes. And we cease to see with the eyes of faith. That's what happened to the people of Nazareth. They couldn't see that a new thing was happening in Christ. Their eyes were so fixed on the world. They wanted miracles. They wanted their circumstances to change. They did not want to submit their lives and their hearts to the unshakable truth of God's word. They wanted something more. But friends, the reality is, there is nothing more. God works in us as his people. He accomplishes his purposes in us by the power of the Spirit working in and through his word to create faith. We live by faith and not by sight. If we have not the faith to receive his word, we will never receive Christ. What we see will not matter. You want proof? Many of the people who witnessed these signs, the people of Capernaum and Cana and Galilee and Jerusalem, were the exact same people who had Christ crucified. They had seen with their eyes, but they never received him in faith. They never received his word. And so they could not receive him. That is why Christ says to these people here, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, not in your seeing, so that their dependence would not be on what they see for a moment, but on the enduring, steadfast, and unchanging truth of God's word. Christ came to them preaching and teaching because he knew that what these people needed was not a good show, but good news of salvation to be received by faith. And that proves to be just a bridge too far for the people of Nazareth. They could not see Christ for who he was because they were not seeing with the eyes of faith. They were looking at him with the eyes of the flesh. They thought they knew what they needed. Just give us signs, Jesus. But Jesus knew that they needed something so much deeper, something so much more. And in this, Christ exposes another part of their hearts. And he exposes another part of our hearts. He exposes a prideful independence that fails to recognize our need. That's what he explains in verses 25 through 26, if you look back there with me. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land, and Elijah was sent to none of them but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed but only Naaman the Syrian. Christ here cites two examples of miraculous signs done by prophets of the Lord among Gentile people. First, the miracle done by Elijah to the widow of Zarephath during the famine when her son had died and she was starving for bread. And the Lord sent Elijah to raise her son from the dead and to miraculously provide for her hunger. And then the miracle done by Elisha for Naaman, the Syrian, who had come to him for cleansing and healing. Here's what Christ is saying in these two examples. Both Elisha and Elijah, the prophets of the Lord, were rejected by their people. 
They wanted nothing to do with Elijah and Elisha. And so the Lord sent these prophets to to demonstrate the power of the kingdom of God to people who knew their need. To Gentiles who needed to be fed and cleansed and raised to life. This is the upside down kingdom of God that Christ our prophet brings with him. Christ comes to the spiritually dead and brings life. He comes to the spiritually blind and brings true sight. He comes to the spiritually sick and brings cleansing and healing. Christ comes to those who are prepared to realize their need. And so what Christ is telling the people of Nazareth here, these children of Abraham is that y'all don't realize it, but you are worse off than a Gentile widow and a Syrian leper. Because they realize their need, and you will not. Gentiles believe the word of God, and you will not. And so the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to them. And this is just too much for the people of Nazareth. This final word proved to be too much. The people of Nazareth erupted, as it says, in wrath. Why? Because Christ had exposed their hearts. And he exposes our hearts as well. Do we, like the people of Nazareth, hear the word of Christ? The good news of freedom and true sight and liberty. Do we hear this word and say functionally in our hearts, well, that would be good news if I was spiritually blind. That would be good news if I was held captive to something. But I'm doing just fine. What else do you got, Jesus? Jesus. Do we realize our need? Have we realized the fact that whether we realize it or not, whether we feel it or not, we are spiritually blind? We are held captive to our flesh. We are crushed by our transgressions, crushed by the impending weight of God's judgment if we stand on our own. Have we realized that? If we haven't, the message of Christ here will not make sense to us. And when confronted with Christ in our hearts, we'll react just like the people of Nazareth. With unbelief, with rejection, and with wrath. You see, being exposed for who we truly are will either soften our hearts in repentance and needful dependence on Christ, or it will harden our hearts in rejection and unbelief. And that's what we see at the end of this passage, isn't it? That's just what we see. We see Christ driven out of this synagogue by the people of Nazareth, by this crowd, in an attempt to kill him. The crowd went so quickly from admiring his words to desperately wanting him killed. What had changed? What was so controversial? Christ had preached a message that had exposed their hearts. In effect, ultimately, he had told them, because you have rejected me and my word, God will reject you forever. So they try to kill him. They drive him out of town to execute him. But miraculously, he's saved. This time. But there would be a time where the people of Israel's rejection of Christ would be complete. Where they would not just try to kill him, they would actually kill him where Christ would be driven outside of the camp and not miraculously saved by God. You see, it was actually the rejection of the people of God through which God would accomplish salvation. 
the wrath of the people of Nazareth would be nothing compared to the wrath of God that Christ would bear on the cross. And that is good news for us. Because that's how we're saved. We need to remember this. Because it's easy for us to look back on this text, to look back on the people of Nazareth who rejected Christ, to even look back on the people of Jerusalem that crucified Christ, and to begin to say in our hearts, well, I would never do that. Yes, you would, if not for the grace of God. That is why we need the gospel. We have God's word and we fail to believe it and we fail to do what it says. We need the gospel. We need this good news of this passage. The good news that even though we reject God every day, because of His grace, because of Jesus, God does not reject us. God accomplished our salvation through the rejection of His sons so that we may be adopted as sons and daughters. That's the good news of this passage for us. So that when we come to Christ in faith, we are all welcomed, we are all accepted into the celebration of the year of Jubilee, into the celebration of the forgiveness of our sins, into the celebration of freedom, into the celebration of true life and liberty. By faith, we live now under this promise of salvation in Christ. Would this promise be enough for us? Would we treasure the good news of the gospel? Would we let the word of God expose our hearts, expose our need, expose our sin, so that we may turn in faith, we may run to Christ for forgiveness and cleansing and new life? Amen. Let us pray. Father, thank you for the message of the gospel. Thank you for the Savior who has brought to us a complete salvation in His person and work. By Your Word and Spirit, work in our hearts. Would Your Word not just fall vainly on our ears, but would it penetrate deep into our hearts? You've promised, Father, that Your Word is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword that your word searches all of the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. Search our hearts, Father. Show us our unbelief in your word. Show us our rejection of Christ. Show us our functional independence. Expose our need for a Savior. And by your Spirit, draw us in faith to him. Draw us in repentance to him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.